Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Jeannie Hay. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences um, at the University of New England, and I'm thrilled to, to be here uh, for my first of, of many uh, P.D. Merrill Lectures in Business Ethics. I want to uh, welcome all the members of the community who are here today, as well as to our speaker, Diana Enriquez, to Governor Angus King, and to the multiple members of the UNE family who are here this afternoon and who also attended our event earlier today. That includes our students, our staff, our faculty, our administrators, and a number of members of the Board of Trustees. And I would appreciate, as, as I name you, and I, and I hope we got everybody, um, I'd like to ask the members of the Board of Trustees to stand as I, as, as I name you. I understand that we have here today uh, two former members of our board, Dr. Ed Friedman and Donna Cheney, as well as current members of our board, Sandy Goulden, Robert McAfee, go ahead, you may stand up, <laughs> Diane Collins-Field, Charlie King, and of course, the chair of our board, Mike Morell. Um, and if anybody snuck in at the last moment, I apologize. But I just, I, I wanted to recognize the members of our board because it's hard to overstate what they do uh, uh, on behalf of our university and the generosity that they show. So thank you for coming. I did not know Paul D. Merrill, um, and by all accounts, I'm uh, the lesser for it. Um, he was a trustee and a great friend uh, to the University of New England and a very highly respected member of our community. And I would like to thank uh, the members of the P.D. Merrill Business Ethics Lecture Committee, uh, and especially its chair, uh, Professor Mike Daly, uh, uh, Associate Professor of Economics um, at UNE, who work very hard to secure top-notch speakers for this series every year. And their hard work is represented in um, our speaker today, Diana Enriquez. Um, I also want to make special note um, in acknowledging Sandy Goulden and um, P.D. Merrill's wife, and their son, Ethan, who is here this afternoon as well. Sandy is a UNE trustee, and she's the visionary behind this lecture. And we're so appreciative of her generosity in time, resources, commitment, and energy to make this series um, not only continue to be possible, but to excel in the way that it does. Finally, um, I'd like to introduce former governor of Maine, the Honorable Angus King, uh, whom I had the uh, great pleasure of meeting for the first time this afternoon, who will introduce our speaker. As I'm a newcomer to Maine, and I'm still uh, getting to know the culture, the political culture here, um, I, I asked, uh, you know, what should I include when I, when I introduce uh, Governor King? What should I say by way of introduc introduction? And the very uh, common response was, Angus King needs no introduction to any audience in the state of Maine. <laughs> so, um, but what some may not know is that he is a very close friend and ally of the University of New England. Um, that he was a close friend of P.D. Merrill and that his son is a current undergraduate student um, on the Biddeford campus and helped us secure a much uh, hard won victory in, in a lacrosse game last night. So um, we're thrilled to have, um, um, to have the former governor's support and participation in the UNE community. So please um, join me in welcoming a man who needs no introduction, Angus King. Thank you. Well, first, the most important announcement of the day, the UNE men's lacrosse team <laughs> last night beat Gordon College in this, with five seconds left in the second overtime, nine to eight, for the first time in 15 years. So it was a wonderful <laughs> evening. And if you haven't been to the Biddeford campus and seen the big blue turf, it's really quite a sight. It's one of only three blue turf fields in the country, and there are rumors that seagulls are confused by it, but they aren't true. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here again and, and to be here for this occasion, and the only downside is it always makes me miss my friend P.D. 
uh, who I knew for almost 20 years. I served on a board with him when we uh, socialized together. We knew each other uh, quite well. And it's so appropriate to have this lecture series focused on the issue of ethics because PD was one of the most ethical people I've ever known. Uh, the, the idea of, of, of doing something, cutting corners, doing something slightly wrong, taking advantage, it just wasn't the kind of person he was. And as I think we're going to learn today, uh, ethics, in, we can pass all the laws we want, but if you have a culture that's unethical, if people, individual people, aren't ethical, uh, the whole thing falls apart. Uh, it's all based upon relationships of trust, and uh, PD just, for me, embodied uh, the idea of ethical conduct, of doing the right thing, even if nobody is watching, and even if it might cost you something. Uh, but that was just the kind of person that he was. Now, our guest today is a journalist. And I, uh, many years ago, I have ha hastened to, I don't want to calculate, but it was probably 35 or 40 years ago, I used to represent newspapers when I was practicing law in Brunswick. And I, one of the papers I represented was the Maine Times, and the Maine Times was subjected to what at that time, and I think still is, the largest single libel suit in Maine history. And I defended the, the paper in that case, and it caused me to reflect upon journalism and what journalism really is. And if you think about it, what journalists are, who journalists are, are people we hire to tell us about things that we either don't have time for or can't experience directly. That's what a journalist is. They're a paid friend. If, if you come home and a, a, a building burns down on your street, you ask your neighbor, what happened? And they describe it and tell you what happened. That's journalism. And so journalists are people who we ask to help us experience things vicariously and learn from them vicariously. History and journalism are nothing more than condensed experience. Experience that we aren't, for whatever reason, because of the busyness of our lives or where we spend our time, we can't be there to know what goes on. And journalism and news and, and, and information are at the heart of our democracy. Thomas Jefferson famously observed, if I were to have to choose between government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I would immediately choose the latter. Now, lest you get too excited about that, Diana, Jefferson is sort of like scripture. You can find something, you know, on all sides. He also said, the man who reads nothing at all is better educated than the man who only reads newspaper. <laughs> I think that's kind of interesting, too. But journalists are people that we need to explain things to us, to help us to understand what happened. And our guest today is someone who has been doing that exceedingly well, particularly in a field that's hard to understand, finance and business and the world of Wall Street. And she's written an extraordinary book uh, about Bernie Madoff and the experience of that case, which touched thousands of lives and is continuing to do so and has actually cost lives where people have in their distress have taken their own lives as a result of his actions. He's in jail for the rest of his life, almost certainly. She's the only journalist, I believe, who has actually talked to him, who's interviewed him in, in prison, and has a kind of first-person narrative in this book. So we're very fortunate to have her with us tonight, it's this afternoon. It could not be more appropriate to have somebody talking about the implications of the Madoff case and, and the, the implications of the financial uh, problems of the last several years, how they've affected people uh, who, who has seen it firsthand and who has the uh, incredible skill of being able to convey these complex uh, ideas in ways that we can understand and more importantly, benefit from. So I'm honored to introduce to you Diana Henriquez, and by the way, you're also lucky today that you have two speakers from Virginia. <laughs> She's from the south side, I'm from Alexandria. I, 
I don't mention it too much politically. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to be born in Maine, but my mother was in Virginia that day. And, and it was a big day for her, so I thought I should be there. Uh, but Diana is an extraordinary journalist. She's a contributing writer at the New York Times, has had a very distinguished career, and has written an important cautionary tale for all of our lives. Diana, welcome to Maine. Thank you, Governor King, for that very warm introduction. And when I consider the hard time that Thomas Jefferson had from the newspapers of his day, it makes his initial quote even more remarkable and his second quote even more understandable. I like to think that journalism has improved a bit uh, since that era, but sometimes you sort of wonder. Nevertheless, it is both a pleasure and an honor to be here as part of this important and distinguished lecture series. And I want to commend the Merrill family for underwriting such an important topic so generously. It is a way truly to send a set of values out into the future for generations. Just one caveat, bit of, bit of housekeeping. While I don't think my views on Ponzi schemes and business ethics differ markedly from those of the New York Times, my remarks today reflect only my own opinions and not those of the newspaper. I've spent the last three years learning everything I could about Bernie Madoff and his historic fraud, the largest Ponzi scheme in history. His global fraud erased $65 billion in wealth that his investors believed they had when they went to bed the night before his arrest. It created out-of-pocket losses of about $18 billion. It stretched from Palm Beach to the Persian Gulf and affected tens of thousands of people at every rung on the economic ladder, from bold-faced names in Hollywood to retired school teachers in New Mexico. As Governor King said, at least two investors that we know of committed suicide when they learned of their Madoff losses. It was a devastating crime by every measure, and it was the brainchild of this one man, this man, Bernie Madoff. Why did he do it? I think we can concede that Madoff was ethically challenged, but where did that come from? It isn't useful to say he was a sociopath. Steve Jobs was a sociopath. You know, lots of sociopaths become brilliant entrepreneurs. That doesn't explain anything. His father, Ralph Madoff, was a serial business failure. After several setbacks and one large bankruptcy, Ralph Madoff set up a one-man firm called Gibraltar Securities to recruit investors for small businesses for a fee, but he deceptively put that business in his wife's name because his own credit history was in ruins. Like his earlier efforts, this small firm also failed. But unlike his earlier efforts, this little firm had been based on a lie. A small lie, perhaps, but still a lie. Certainly, his precarious finances caused intense insecurity for the young Madoff family, and perhaps those anxieties help explain a little of Bernie Madoff's nearly pathological refusal to admit failure at anything in his own life. Indeed, in my first of two interviews with him in prison, and just to correct the record, I was the first journalist uh, to interview Madoff, and the only one to interview him twice in prison. But after my second interview, a friend said he became the chatty Cathy of the federal penal system and uh, started chatting with a few other, few other uh, journalists. But in my first interview with him in prison, he startled me when he refused to even admit that his epic Ponzi scheme had been a failure. Uh, well, Bernie, you're in jail. Um, obviously, it had failed. No, no, no. He insisted he could have kept it going, despite the panic in the markets and those crazy weeks we, we remember in late 2008. People were still eager to invest with him, he said, so no, 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 no. He didn't fail at his Ponzi scheme. He simply got tired of the constant tap dance of raising new money 
and decided to quit. I'm glad we got that straightened out. But there was an even more revealing incident back in 1962 when the young Bernie Madoff, not much older than some of you students here, was investing money for some family and friends. He rashly and unwisely invested these clients' money in high-risk, newly issued stocks in the Wild West over-the-counter market. Then in May of 1962, the market hit an air pocket. At the time, it was the worst week in the stock market since 1929. We don't even remember it now, but for young brokers of Bernie's generation, it was a shocking week. The ticker was running hours late. Uh, people were being ruined. It was, it was a horrible time. And Madoff lost tens of thousands of dollars entrusted to him in that market crash. But rather than admit that, Rather than call up Uncle Joe or Aunt Mary and say, you know, I'm sorry, I lost it all. He covered it up. He used all his young firm's capital to buy those shares back out of those accounts at par and cover up the losses without ever telling his clients what he had done. They no doubt thought, gee, what a genius this guy Madoff is. He gets through the worst week in the market since 29, and I never lost a penny. A lie. A small one. Certainly not a Ponzi scheme lie, but still a lie. Even then, Bernie Madoff found it easier to live with himself as a liar than to live with himself as a failure. The fraud he eventually used to sustain that illusion of success for decades more, a Ponzi scheme, is actually a very old crime. It goes back well before 1920 when an enterprising Boston immigrant named Carlo Ponzi gave it his name. The con name used to be called a Peter to Paul scheme, as in robbing Peter to pay Paul. And you can find examples of it going back well into the 1800s. But Bernie Madoff put his own stamp on the Ponzi scheme, and we'll leave it to history to see whether he will actually change the name of that old Peter to Paul fraud to a Madoff scheme. But as a result of these changes, these innovations, he was able to keep his Ponzi scheme hidden for decades longer than most Ponzi schemes survive. He had computer programs that created the illusion that all those stocks and bonds he was supposed to own were actually stored safely in Wall Street's central clearinghouse. I, I mean, the computer screens were completely bogus. They were invented by a guy who wrote software down the hall, but they looked very real. He kept old letterhead stationery and an old electric typewriter so that he could create realistic-looking backdated documents to satisfy regulators' questions. He swamped his investors with long, detailed account statements, long and complicated enough to look very reassuring, but too long and complicated to tempt anybody to actually read them. He told foreign accountants that he traded with U.S. banks, and he told U.S. regulators he traded with foreign banks, knowing that the extra difficulty involved in making those cross-border checks would likely deter future investigation as it did. Besides his mastery of camouflage, Madoff had a gift for seduction unlike any I've ever seen in a Ponzi schemer in real life or in history. And one of the advantages of covering white collar crime for the New York Times is you get to, get to meet rather a large selection of Ponzi schemers, uh, more than I hope any of you ever encounter. The classic Ponzi personality is a gregarious, charismatic, bon vivant, eager to persuade you that he's the smartest guy in the room. But Madoff was a low-key guy who made you feel like you were the smartest person in the room. What could be more seductive than that? I had a chance to experience this magic trick the first time I interviewed Madoff in prison. I knew him slightly when he worked on the street and I covered him a few times, but I never actually had a chance to talk to him as intensely as I did then. 
and it was intense. I had requested four hours of time from the prison authorities. They granted only two. I did massive triage with my questions overnight and was watching, hearing the clock ticking in, the, in that reporter's back room of mine, um, counting every minute. Well, Madoff started to make a small digression. He was going to teach me, tutor me about a particular investment strategy, shorting against the box if there are any finance mavens in the room. And I knew how it worked. I didn't want to waste a precious second on that digression. So I thanked him and said, I understand that. You hurry up. Well, he leaned over to his lawyer, Ike Sorkin, sitting between us, and he said, oh, it's such a pleasure to deal with such a knowledgeable reporter. I clearly, I was the most knowledgeable, professional, trustworthy, intelligent, experienced reporter he'd ever met. I got to tell you, it felt pretty good. And I already knew he was a liar. <laughs> so I could imagine in that moment how potent that charm must have been when people still thought he was a genius. A genius who thinks I'm the smartest guy in the room. People who probably would have been instantly suspicious of that traditional Ponzi personality, the guy buying drinks over in the corner, they were lured by Madoff's quiet confidence and magnetism. And let's not fool ourselves. We probably would have been drawn in too. Because as different as Madoff was from other Ponzi schemers, he shared one essential characteristic with all of them. He could make you trust him. He could make you trust him. He can make you believe, quite simply, that he was a wizard of Wall Street. This is what so many smug skeptics forget when they look back at the Madoff case with 2020 hindsight, always everyone's favorite vantage point, and boast that they never would have fallen for that guy they saw in handcuffs cuffs being marched across your television screens. Well, that wasn't the guy his investors knew. The guy they knew seemed utterly trustworthy. By definition, every successful Ponzi schemer seems utterly trustworthy. That's a non-negotiable job requirement for a Ponzi schemer. If you can't pull that off, you need to go into another line of crime. Think about it. Let's say you know a guy, and for some reason, ladies, Ponzi schemers almost always are guys. But Say you know a guy, and he doctors his golf score, cheats on his wife, never pays his debts on time. Now that guy may commit any number of white collar crimes. He may cheat on his taxes or lie on his loan applications. He may take bribes or pay them to other people. He may pilfer company property or skim off company cash, but I'll tell you one thing, he will never ever entice you into a Ponzi scheme, will he? No, because you don't trust him enough. So by definition, a successful Ponzi schemer is someone who can earn your trust. Someone who will seem utterly, totally, unquestionably trustworthy. One fraud analyst, Pat Huddleston, put it much better than I in a line I wish I'd written when he warned, if it sounds too good to be true, you're dealing with an amateur. Think about it. Think about it. Madoff was no amateur. He knew how to make it sound just good enough to be attractive, but not too good to be true. Only amateurs did that. So, of course, people trusted him. We probably would have trusted him, too. And that's what makes the moral and ethical questions that surround Madoff's crime so interesting to me. I think that's part of why he remains fascinating as, as years go by and he clicks off another month on that 150-year prison term. He was a well-trusted wizard. And when we fall under the spell of an evil but trusted wizard like Bernie Madoff, every step we take toward him leads us deeper into an ethical quagmire. And I'd like to discuss two aspects of that quagmire with you today. 
But first, let's pause for a moment and think about this idea of wizards, the wizards in our lives, these people who tempt us to trust too much. Who are they? They're people who seem a lot like us, only better. Better. Younger, more successful, slimmer, better at golf, better at everything, better educated, more cultured, more sophisticated, just better. They're so successful at what they do, in fact, that they almost seem to be magic, don't they? And sometimes, sometimes that magic is real. We can all rattle off the names of nature's great, extraordinary exceptions. Einstein, Mozart, Thomas Edison, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, the great Wayne Gretzky of hockey, the young Tiger Woods of golf, the amazing Warren Buffett on Wall Street. Take it a step further. Think about the wizards in your own lives. That student athlete who seems to do everything so well, so effortlessly. That faculty colleague whose research is so original and whose teaching holds you spellbound the father of your good friend who seems to soar right to the top of the ladder without a single misstep or stumble. These are people who are so magically, so consistently successful that you always give them the benefit of the doubt, and you never worry about taking what they say on faith. They inspire trust, and almost always they deserve our trust. I could name some wizards in my own profession. Journalists who were given more than the usual amount of latitude by editors simply because they were so magically good at their craft. A few were frauds who fell into shame and scandal, but most were the real deal and they went on to greatness and well-earned glory. Clearly, not all of life's wizards are Ponzi schemers. But all of life's Ponzi schemers are wizards, at least in the minds of their victims, because if they weren't, they would not have the power that they have. And the great thing about being a wizard is that almost nobody expects you to play by the same rule book as the rest of us. People waive the rules for the special wizards in their lives all the time without ever considering that doing so is a potentially disastrous breach of ethics. Now, Madoff benefited enormously from this commonplace tendency to treat our trusted wizards differently. Regulators ignored warning signs that would have made them instantly suspicious of a lesser genius. They had a different standard for wizards, like Madoff. Due diligence lawyers at major banks and senior accountants at global CPA firms all around the world, they made exceptions for Madoff that they never granted other lesser money managers. They too had a different yardstick for geniuses. Institutional investors demanded less paperwork, less transparency, less cooperation from Madoff than they demanded from others. Different yardstick. That's what happens when people think you're a wizard. You don't have to bend the rules. All the people who believe in you will bend them for you. Consider the news accounts about MF Global, the commodities investment firm run by former New Jersey governor and Senator John Corzine, who had spent decades as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs. It has been reported that the MF Global directors dismissed warnings from the firm's chief risk officer about the portfolio Corzine had assembled. After all, Corzine was a paid up member of the Goldman Sachs Wizard Fraternity. So his directors exempted him from the risk officer's <laughs> discipline and it destroyed the firm. Look back at any number of Wall Street and business scandals from Teapot Dome to Enron and you'll see the same thing. The extraordinarily successful trader, that star institutional salesman, a quantitative genius down on the derivatives desk, who knows what he does but he's a genius, the brilliant CFO, wizards every one of them, 
wizards who could get away with almost anything, no, ma no questions asked, because no one demanded that they live by the same rules as the rest of us. Wall Street can usually be counted on to come up with a totally tasteless joke about any major disaster that happens, and Madoff kind of stymied them. But they did come up with one funny joke about the Madoff scandal. Traders would joke that once and for all the case proved that there's really no such thing as a sophisticated investor. Hundreds, if not thousands, of sophisticated people, lawyers, bankers, hedge fund managers, accountants, utterly failed to save their clients or themselves from Bernie Madoff. It's easy to dismiss these actions as a lapse of judgment, but I think what happened is that these people flunked a business ethics quiz they didn't know they were taking. They would have been on the alert if they'd been dealing with some stranger they thought would pressure them to cut corners. Oh yes, they'd have had their moral compass out on day one if they'd been dealing with someone whose track record was a little shady, a little conflicted, a, a little mysterious. But they weren't dealing with someone like that. They were dealing with someone they thought they knew, someone they thought they could trust, a highly respected man on Wall Street named Bernie Madoff. The Madoff story reminds us that everyone, from hedge fund geniuses to retired school teachers, simply everyone invests primarily as a leap of faith. And we decide whom to trust for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with all the fine print that regulators think will keep us safe. If we would only read every word of the fine print, and we don't. Admit that you don't, at least to yourself, I admit I don't. We don't need to read the fine print if we're dealing with someone we trust, right? And why do we decide to trust the people we do trust? Well, they seem knowledgeable. They have a good track record. Other people we trust have faith in them. They observe all the rules that trustworthy people follow. They pay their bills on time. They don't cheat at poker or golf. They're comfortable and disciplined and well-behaved and generous. And they don't tell obvious lies. In short, we trust them because they seem a lot like, um, well, Bernie Madoff, who before his arrest, was immensely knowledgeable about his field and widely respected and admired by other successful people. He never got drunk and never flew off the handle. He paid his bills on time. He was generous to charity and seemed honest and faithful to his wife, Ruth. He would have passed that trustworthiness test with flying colors. In fact, he did pass that trustworthy test with flying colors for decades after he had become a multi-billion dollar crook. So, in hindsight, the clues were there all the time. But the trust Madoff inspired shone so brightly that no one could see them. How did that happen? How many of you are familiar with that famous Harvard cognitive function test called the invisible gorilla? Anyone familiar with that? Well, I'm going to spoil it for you now, I'm afraid. Um, the test involves a short video clip of two basketball teams, one in white uniforms and one in black uniforms. And the test taker's job is to count every time the team in white passes the ball in an intense high-speed game. In the middle of this video clip, here's the spoiler alert, a student dressed in a full-body gorilla suit walks onto the basketball court, faces the camera for dramatic effect and beats her chest a few times, and walks off. It takes about six seconds in an eight or nine minute video clip. At the end of the test, the test takers are asked, um, did you notice anything odd during the game? No. So you didn't notice the gorilla then. A remarkable percentage of people who take that test drop their jaw and say, gorilla? Are you crazy? A gorilla on the basketball? Listen, if there had been a gorilla on that basketball court, I'd have seen it. How could you miss it? How could anybody miss a gorilla on a basketball court? So there'd been no gorilla. But there had been a gorilla. And they had missed it. 
When they were shown the film clip a second time, some of them were sure that Harvard had changed the film clip. They, they'd substituted a different clip. When they were brought to believe, no, no, this is the same clip, they simply couldn't believe they'd missed seeing that gorilla because they saw it clear as day after they knew what to look for. That same cognitive failing is at work when police gather confident eyewitness testimony that turns out so often to be dead wrong. Indeed, a notable percentage of the death row convictions that have been reversed by the Innocence Project because of new DNA evidence originally rested on the confident eyewitness testimony of people who were absolutely certain that they had seen exactly what happened and who unwittingly incriminated an innocent man. All of us, even those who take great pride in their skepticism, and maybe especially those who take great pride in their skepticism, all of us have the capacity to miss what seems to be right under our noses if we're not expecting it, if we're focused intently on something else, or if we have let our trust in someone else, or our trust in our own judgment about someone else, blur our vision. You see, we're probably hardwired to trust one another. For most of, it, most of us, that's our default position. When we meet someone, we're inclined to think they're trustworthy until they prove otherwise, especially if they look and sound and live a lot like us. Now, some scientists think the inclination to trust one another had some evolutionary advantage, and I can see how that would work. Surely cave dwellers who trusted one another would have fared better on their hunting expeditions than cave dwellers who were riddled with suspicion and mistrust. Of course, that suggests that the only sure vaccine for Ponzi schemes is clinical paranoia. And while it's true that Ponzi schemes are impossible in a world utterly devoid of trust, modern commerce is also impossible in a world utterly devoid of trust. Indeed, most of human society is impossible in such a world. So clearly, we cannot fault those lawyers and accountants and hedge fund managers simply for trusting Bernie Madoff. We are all hardwired to trust one another. That's not the fault that they trusted Bernie Madoff. We can't simply decree that nobody should trust anybody either, unless we want to bring human commerce and human society to a halt. But what we must realize is that our inclination to trust others and our ill-placed faith in our own gut instincts can combine to create blind spots big enough to hide a fraud as big as Bernie Madoff's. And by definition, we never see our own blind spots until it's too late. That's one of the two ethical dilemmas I want to discuss with you today. How do we monitor and police the people we truly trust? Policing the people we're suspicious of is easy, right? You watch them like a hawk. You got rules, you got monitors, you got cameras. You got... How do we police the people we truly trust? Is it unethical to play favorites? To have one rule book for the wizards of the world and another rule book for the rest of us. Now this situation, so common in our lives and yet so rarely recognized as an ethical dilemma, is technically, the ethicists would tell you, a conflict of interest, although it's admittedly an odd sort of one. But as a professional journalist, I've had to deal with this kind of conflict issue countless times in my career. In some cases, there are bright lines that make conflicts like this quite easy to detect. For example, I don't cover news stories about close friends or loved ones or about institutions in which I have a close personal stake, like my college or my husband's employer. That would clearly be unethical. And most journalists would see such a conflict instantly and know to avoid it. Here's a wrinkle on that. Sometimes, over time, Professional sources gradually become more than just sources. You meet for dinner a few times. You chit-chat about the kids. 
And gradually, as that relationship changes, the journalist must monitor when sources have become so close to the line of personal friendship that the journalist can no longer ethically write about them. It is a difficult call. I've had to make it only a handful of times in 45 years. But it's one that every journalist has to make from time to time because we know that we simply cannot write about friends with the neutrality and skepticism and impartial judgment that our job requires. It would be foolish and arrogant to believe that we could, to believe that our judgment is so insulated from our emotions as to eliminate any dangers from this conflict of interest. So let's go back now to those accountants and those other professionals who failed so spectacularly in the Madoff case. The regulators, the examiners, auditors, due diligence lawyers, investment bankers, hedge fund managers, who trusted Bernie Madoff. Now they all had high professional standards of conduct, tough due diligence tests, best practices that set them apart. But what they didn't have was enough humility about their own judgment to realize that their decision to trust Madoff, to waive the rule book for Madoff, to cultivate a close relationship with Madoff, had created a devastating conflict of interest that impaired their ability to do the right thing. They trusted Madoff too much because they trusted themselves too much. Most of them were so convinced they were right about Bernie Madoff that they never even considered the possibility that this Wall Street statesman might be running a Ponzi scheme. Now, is there a way to avoid this deadly blind spot? There are some clues woven into the Madoff story. In my book, The Wizard of Lies, you'll meet a very wealthy retired businessman who wanted to invest with Madoff, but ultimately didn't because he had a firm rule about how much he would entrust to a new money manager. And it was well below Madoff's minimum du jour, which I'm convinced Madoff made up on the spot, depending on the bankroll of who was sitting across from him. But this was a fixed amount, quarter of a million dollars maximum. That's all he would give to a new money manager. And Madoff explained, well, sorry, my minimum is $5 million. Can't do it. Now, this businessman could have easily written a check for $5 million. For him, it would have been a rounding error. He could have done it. But he wrestled, wrestled a little more and decided, no, no, he, he wouldn't. The rule had stood him in good stead over the years. And, and as much as he wanted to invest with Madoff, he wasn't going to break it. He wasn't going to waive the rule for this incredible wizard. So disappointed, chagrined, he shook Madoff's hand and left, not even knowing what an escape he'd had until Madoff was arrested. Similarly, a charity in New York was tempted to invest with Madoff. So many of its donors did. They got such good results. He was such a generous and charitable man himself. And they had a chance to invest with him, and they wanted to, but they had this rule, tested over time, that they would only invest with a money manager who used an independent third-party custodian institution to hold the assets. Somebody outside to be sure those stocks and bonds were there. And Madoff didn't use a third-party custodian. So the only way they could invest with Madoff was to waive that rule for Madoff and they wanted to, they were tempted to, but they didn't. They had enough respect for the people who'd put that rule in place that they stuck to their guns and disappointed, walked away. Now, did you notice the trick? The businessman, the charity, were spared not because they were suspicious of Bernie Madoff. Far from it. Like everybody else clamoring to invest with Bernie Madoff, they trusted him, trusted him completely. Like everyone else, they thought he was a genius, but they knew that people are fallible. And so they made some sensible rules, and they had stuck to them over the years, even when they were sorely tempted to waive those rules for this wonderful wizard they trusted so much. 
The board of MF Global didn't have to be suspicious of former Governor Corzine. It simply had to be humble enough about its own judgment to listen to the chief risk officer's warning and take it seriously. The board of Enron, it didn't need to be suspicious of its brilliant CFO. It just had to stick to the time-tested rule that immensely lucrative conflicts of interest in the chief executive's uh, suite are never a good idea because, well, you might be wrong about the CFO's character. They didn't need to be suspicious. They just needed to resist the temptation to waive the rules for the people they had decided could be trusted without the rules. Trust is a two-edged sword, and the magic spell that can keep us safe from the occasional evil wizard is not suspicion, it's humility. We must recognize that we all make mistakes, we all have blind spots. Once we trust someone, we all can miss the invisible gorillas beating their chest and warning us that we're in trouble. But those who fell prey to Bernie Madoff forgot that or ignored it, and that, that was their downfall. Not that they trusted Madoff, but that they forgot they could have been wrong in trusting Bernie Madoff. Now even worse, a few of those who entrusted their own and their clients' money to Bernie Madoff actually did wonder if maybe Bernie was a little crooked. They suspected he might be committing a form of insider trading called front-running, using his knowledge about incoming order flow at his legitimate brokerage firm to earn little secret profits for them, his clients. But even though they suspected he was sort of a criminal, they were confident that he wasn't that kind of criminal. They were right that he was breaking the law, they were wrong about the crime he was committing. But because they had so much faith in their own judgment, they failed to see that they were confronting a serious conflict of interest when it came to monitoring Bernie Madoff. That's when we lose our moral compass, when we think our own judgment will always be true north. If these professionals had simply adhered to their principles as faithfully and humbly as that businessman and that charity did, they'd have realized they might have been wrong about Madoff too. And realizing that, for safety's sake, they'd have insisted that Madoff comply with the rules, however much they admired and trusted him. And when he refused, as he surely would have done, they too would have sadly but firmly walked away without ever realizing what a close call they had. A clearer grasp of business ethics would have pulled them out of harm's way in time. Of course, not everyone thought Bernie Madoff was a fabulous Wall Street wizard, or at worst, a guy who bent the rules a little to earn them a nice steady profit. A few people suspected all along that Madoff was a con artist running a massive swindle. And that brings us to the second big ethical knot we need to unravel in the aftermath of this epic crime. The Madoff story made it clear, if the rest of 2008 hadn't, that there simply is no old-fashioned honor code on Wall Street. An honor code of the sort Thomas Jefferson invented for the, or wrote out for the University of Virginia, that ironclad commitment to neither lie, cheat, nor steal, nor tolerate those who do. Now, there are tens of thousands of decent, law-abiding, ethical people working on Wall Street who would never, ever lie, cheat, or steal from their company or its clients. But what about tolerating those who do? <laughs> That's the rub, isn't it? That's the rub for all of us. After Madoff's arrest, a small army of hedge fund managers and private bankers and industry consultants came forward to claim, well, they'd seen through Bernie Madoff's magic all along. They'd never believed that he was anything but a crook. They'd kept their clients out of trouble. Well, imagine how different this story would have been 
if all those brilliant, impressive, influential folks who came forward after Madoff's arrest had quietly taken their doubts to the SEC, or better yet, the FBI, before Madoff's arrest. But they didn't. They just quietly escorted their clients out of harm's way and waited until the roof fell in on somebody else's clients. So here is the second post-Madoff question I think we need to wrestle with. Are we our brother's keeper when our brother is wandering around Wall Street? What is it about the Wall Street world that caused so many decent, ethical people to keep silent for so long about Madoff, about the rising risk of mortgage securities, about predatory loans and sloppy foreclosure filings and dubious underwriting standards and unethical rating agencies? What is it about the broader world of business that makes people so reluctant to report wrongdoing? and so quick to heap scorn on those who do report it? And is there some way to change that? In the aftermath of the Madoff scandal, the SEC overhauled its entire machinery for dealing with whistleblowers. The new system even gets high marks from that notable whistleblower, Harry Markopoulos, the quirky Boston analyst who tried repeatedly to persuade the SEC that there was something fishy about Bernie Madoff. The new system doesn't rely on some sort of honor code, as Jefferson would have. It relies on a whistleblower's greed. It offers cash incentives in the form of a share in the penalties that the SEC ultimately collects in exchange for timely, useful information about wrongdoing. Now, this may encourage more people to blow the whistle on corporate misbehavior, and I'm sure we all hope that it does. But it will do nothing, I promise you, to improve the image of whistleblowers in the business community. Indeed, it will likely compound the image problem, which is pretty bad already. Look at all the synonyms we have for those who report wrongdoing when they see it. Snitch, stool pigeon, rat, tattletale, the nicest synonym in the modern thesaurus is informer, which doesn't sound too bad if you don't say it with a sneer, informer. So no, no, adding a bounty to the whistleblower equation isn't going to help that image problem at all. Whistleblowers are still going to be objects of scorn unless we have a deeper, more profound cultural change. Consider that bizarre accounting scandal unveiled at the Olympus Corporation in Japan over the past year, where long ago investment losses were covered up year after year by successive generations of accountants and top executives. In that scandal, the stool pigeon was the company's new CEO, and even he got fired for blowing the whistle. We might think it was his duty to report wrongdoing to his board of directors, but they thought it was his duty to keep silent and preserve the corporation's reputation in the marketplace. Perhaps you've heard the story of the security guard of the Swiss bank, who in 1997 discovered that stacks of old account ledgers were being shredded by bank employees in the night. He secretly salvaged what he could, and he turned them over to a group that was pursuing Holocaust-era property claims against that bank, claims that were supported by those ledgers. His actions helped the claimants win a substantial settlement against the bank. But do you know what happened to that security guard? Ever wonder? He became the first Swiss citizen in history to be granted political asylum in the United States. His life in Switzerland had become a nightmare of threats against him and his family, official ones from the authorities concerned about bank secrecy and anonymous ones from his fellow citizens. Even his children were threatened. He left, and he sought refuge here, believing that the U.S. would at least be safer and maybe marginally more tolerant of whistleblowers. And it is, 
It is scorned they may be, but whistleblowers in the U.S. are not quite the pariahs they are in many other countries. But it's still not a career move you're dreaming of making, is it, future graduates? So the Madoff case forces us to ask ourselves some very tough questions. Why is it that society almost universally condemns the very behavior that could have shut down the massive Madoff crime long before it cost tens of thousands of people their life savings, long before it had cost at least two ruined investors their very lives. I'm told that in prison, Bernie Madoff is admired today as a stand-up guy for not having fingered any of his accomplices. In fact, at his plea hearing, he actually perjured himself by swearing an oath that he had acted alone. Although his right-hand man, Frank DePascali, at that very moment was negotiating a plea deal in which he would plead guilty to helping Madoff carry out this fraud. Indeed, four other people have pleaded guilty. Five more are awaiting trial on, on indictments that they deny. To inmates, blowing the whistle is definitely not an act of honor and integrity. In prison, an honorable man is one who keeps quiet about the wrongdoing of others. Is corporate America, are we one bit more enlightened than those inmates? Let's play a thought game. Let's say, students, you're the CFO of an upstanding ethical company with no skeletons in its closet. You're proud of your financial controls. You work for a place like P.D. Merrill ran, and you, you feel sure that your track record is spotless. And you found the perfect candidate for that vacancy as your senior deputy. And then you discover that this person, years ago in another company, blew the whistle on an accounting fraud that he had discovered. Will you hire him? If you do hire him, will your fellow executives trust him? Or will you be inclined to maybe keep quiet about that little stop on his career path, just in case they take it the wrong way? You're on campus. Do you feel an obligation to report those who cheat or steal or lie? Or do you feel a stronger obligation to keep quiet, to be a team player? Do you feel a stronger duty to protect the institution's research funding or its reputation by looking the other way in the lab or in the administration building? And if you did speak up, how do you think you would be treated by your peers? Yes, these are difficult ethical questions. And the Madoff case reminds us with painful, heartbreaking clarity how much is hanging on how we answer those questions. If we continue to believe that we can trust our gut about who is honest and ignore the conflicts that creates, and if we continue to scorn the people who blow the whistle on wrongdoing and ignore the hypocrisy that involves, in short, if we do what we've always done, then we'll get what we've always gotten, a world in which the next Bernie Madoff will feel right at home. Now, you know the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So as you wrestle with your answers to these puzzles in your own lives, please consider this warning from the final pages of my book. In a world of lies, the most dangerous ones are those we tell ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. During the Q&A, please wait to use the microphone before you ask your question. 
I, I think there are microphones on both sides. Yes. And I'm having a little trouble with the light seeing your hands, so maybe if you just could stand, if that's not difficult. Ah, okay, there you go. Ask away. Oh, oh, I know the microphones are in the aisles. I thought you were standing to ask a question. Are there, are there questions that you would like to pose? Here we have our hands up. Gentleman getting the mic right there. I wonder if you would comment on the situation where we can, we, can, we can feel that, geez, I really don't trust this person and I don't know why. And we can have a gut instinct um, about not trusting this person. And we can turn out, it can turn out that we're wrong and that in fact this person was in fact trustworthy. So our, our gut can be, you talked about our gut being wrong in that yes, this is a trustworthy person and we find out in fact they were not. But I wonder if you care to comment on the obverse of that. It can work the other way. I think it less often does, just based on, on the sociology studies that I've examined in the course of uh, research for uh, The Wizard of Lies. I, I think what get, the key point to remember there is that gut instinct. I've been fascinated by the, by the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Is that on someone else's reading list besides mine? I heartily recommend it. It's, it's sort of the antidote to Malcolm Gladwell's blink. Gladwell stands for the proposition that you can go with your gut. You know, here's this museum curator he opens his book with who looks at this, this antiquity and he instantly suspects maybe it's a counterfeit. Well, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow says, well, if you've had about 10,000 hours of experience assessing antiquities, go with your gut. If you haven't, maybe you should do a little research first. So that, that understanding when we can trust our gut, when we have enough experience of that person, of that situation, of the probabilities, of the likelihoods, that we've had enough experience. I mean, I mean there are things I've done for so long. I've got more than 10,000 hours, I believe, believe me, in reading newspaper headlines. So when I see what headline a copy editor has decided to put on my story, I got a good, pretty good gut about whether or not that headline is going to confuse people, send them off in the wrong direction, not be clear, and we can have a conversation about my gut reaction to that. My gut reaction about what the auto mechanic tells me is wrong with my muffler? What do I know? I mean, I haven't had 10 minutes studying mufflers. So I think that's where we find the dividing line. We make fairly good gut instinctual decisions where we have a massive amount of expertise and experience. When we don't, we don't. So I think that's an important thing to remember. And we tend to have way too much faith in the accuracy of our gut instincts. There was a question further in the Yes, back. thank you. Yes. Um, I have a concern I would like you to comment on, which I don't think I'm alone in sharing. Uh, we live in a very complex economic environment and we all respond to incentives around us. And my concern is about the incentives that are put in place for the people like Bernie Madoff, Madoff and others who may be functioning in Wall Street today to lie, cheat, steal because it serves the investor's interest. Uh, perhaps to cut corners in service of the stockholders and I'm wondering if we live in a climate in which the incentives to do wrong outweigh the incentives to satisfy our own conscience. You know, I've been a business, an amateur business historian, and I've made a specialty of the study of fraud. So I can confidently reassure you this isn't new. This is not the first generation in which Wall Street has um, put pressure on those who live and work there to cut corners, to maximize profits. Indeed, you could almost say, looking back historically, if you take the longer view, that this is one of the best regulated periods in the modern market's time. I think our regulation has gone a little bit off the rails. I think there, there's been too much of a, of a um, infatuation with the, the glories of deregulation, but I don't think there is anything new about these incentives to lie, cheat, or steal. They've always been there. What 
so what we need to figure out is if that's the case, then how do we police the people we trust so that there are consequences for committing those crimes? That's what changes over time. Not the temptation to do wrong, but the consequences of doing wrong. And that's where we need to address our attention. We, we will never, I submit, change the temptation to do wrong. But I think we can address the consequences of doing wrong on Wall Street more athletically, to put it that way. One of the ideas I suggest in the epilogue of The Wizard of Lies is, well, maybe Wall Street really would police itself if the penalties for wrongdoing were so draconian that they'd be scared to death not to. Do you know in China they execute white collar criminals? I'm not suggesting that we should. I'm just saying that there are other ways to shape the consequences of doing wrong. And if we truly want to address white collar crime, that's what we'll do. Not by trying to produce a world in which there are no incentives to cheat. Maximizing profit is the nature of capitalism. That's it. It's like complaining that dogs bark. Capitalists maximize profits. But you put that capitalist in a well-regulated market, and even Adam Smith suggested that we should, and you can make sure that when he's tempted to cheat, you catch him, or you stop him, or you shut him down so that he can't do it again, and you penalize him. So I think that's where our attention needs to be, in what the consequences of wrongdoing in our modern society are. And I think the track record is they have not, by definition, been serious enough because they have not had a sufficient deterrent effect. And when you know everybody's running the red light, maybe you need to raise the penalties for running the red light. Look what happened with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Drunk driving was an activity that in my father's day was frighteningly common. Older people here in this audience, people my age and older, will remember that. It is now harshly punished by the criminal justice system. And you know what? Doesn't happen as much. So we can reduce the amount of white collar crime we have if the penalties for white collar crime represent actual deterrent penalties. And when people talk to me about regulatory reform, that's what I want to know. So how does this change the penalties for wrongdoing, not how does it change the incentives? I hope that's been helpful. Are there other questions? Yes. I have one over here. Um, it's, as you were talking, I kept having images uh, that flash back to the 60s and 70s, I think it was, when uh, you had five executives from cigarette firms testifying in front of Congress, and they all raised their right hand and said that they had no evidence that smoking was harmful. Um, now, I think I know where where you'll come out on this, but I just wonder if you have a few thoughts to add about that kind of a situation or with uh, investors um, who invest in uh, some of the, um, uh, the new genetic stocks and so on that uh, may have research behind them that is questionable. Uh, is there anything you can add to those two situations? Well, I, I'm... I'm not sure I quite get what you're going at, but I think we do need to understand how easily we can deceive ourselves. If it's very much in our interest to believe that something is true, I can see an executive priding himself on his skepticism about the science that points in the opposite direction. He would see it not as delusional, but as skeptical. Of, of that science. Um, I don't think we're going to you know, get any smarter about that as a society unless we start getting smarter about that as individuals. Um, but uh, in, in, that, in that, of course, famous instance, that, that swearing occurred at a time when the evidence within the firms was mounting and was quite, quite clear. Um, but I don't find myself astonished that people made those representations when there was so much hanging on it in terms of their career and their businesses. Is there another question? 
Yes. My, qu my, oh, yeah. my question is actually about individual investors, which Keep is the mic a little closer. specifically the victims here were individual investors, albeit ones that were defined as sophisticated because of their level of liquid assets. What is your opinion on the you know, much delayed fiduciary standard uh, that's being debated and deferred and obfuscated, but which ultimately would protect all of us? if it were clarified. Uh, uh, clearly, that's my opinion, uh, potentially I, I, not I, yours. I, I know, I, clearly that's your opinion and not mine. And my, these are clearly my opinions and not those of those who will write about this topic for the New York Times. Um, the issue for those who are not in the, uh, in the realm is a, it's a current regulatory debate about whether or not, or about, about which of our financial uh, intermediaries should have a fiduciary duty to us. And that's a freighted term, the lawyers in the room will know, that a fiduciary duty for someone gives you a positive obligation to do what is best for them, not for you, but for them. And penalties presumably would attach if you failed to do so. I, I understand the debate. And I'll be interested to see how it turns out. But I am um, unpersuaded that it is going to be a particularly powerful weapon of investor protection. Because someone who will lie to you will lie to you whether or not they have a fiduciary duty towards you. There's nothing about imposing upon that person a fiduciary duty which will instantly make them say, oh, I was going to rip you off, but now I won't because I have a fiduciary duty not to. I, it doesn't work that way. I, and I worry a little bit that a fiduciary standard will give the unfortunate impression that just the opposite has happened. That in fact, because now a whole subset of stockbrokers who did not previously have a fiduciary duty towards you will have that duty, people will lower their guard and not take the naturally skeptical steps that they should take because you have this fiduciary duty. So it's an important debate mostly because of what it will say about the Wall Street culture. That is where it is important. Is Wall Street willing to take on a fiduciary duty and say, okay, we may have some road brokers who violate it, but this is our mandate and this is what we hope to achieve. It will be aspirational, certainly, but it will tell us something about the Wall Street culture. I understand the practical problems of those who oppose it. I understand the debate about how it should be framed and what the penalties for violation should be. But you could achieve the same thing by increasing the penalties for white collar crime without a fiduciary responsibility. So it still comes down to what happens if you cheat, what happens to you if you cheat. And if the penalties seem, well, you'll be drummed out of the stock brokerage business, you know, this isn't going to be a big deterrent. So I'm, I'm agnostic about that particular debate. I just urge that we not hang too much of our hopes for an honest market on that particular outcome. We have time for one more question. Well, that's pressure. <laughs> um, it, I recognize that Happy Valley isn't Wall Street, but it occurs to me that Penn State and other organizations like that could take a page out of this playbook. I agree with you um, because it is human nature that was at work both in the Penn State situation and in, and in the Madoff case. That, that capacity to trust that, um, and the way trust blinds you to things that if you didn't trust, you'd see instantly. And you know, I, I thought as a new uh, trustee at, at my alma mater, George Washington, um, I was watching that unfold at Penn State with just, I mean, it's your worst nightmare. You just go on the board at Penn State and this mess blows up on your mind. And let me tell you, I'm sure I'm not telling the trustees here anything that hasn't happened in their life. The next board meeting, you wanted to know everything there was to know about how transgressions like that got handled on that campus. 
So we do, we hope, learn from such things. But you're right, these are not problems that are unique to Wall Street. These are not problems that you won't have to worry about as long as you go into widget manufacturing, or that you won't have to worry about as long as your job after graduation is in uh, the oil business. No. These are going to be problems that you are going to confront everywhere you go, because you will meet wizards everywhere. You will need to have a rule book that keeps you safe when you are tempted to waive the rules for those you trust too much. You need to have some answers about your obligations to report wrongdoing when you see it and to make sure it is effectively reported as with a, a nod to Penn State and to respect people who do report wrongdoing as truth tellers, not whistleblowers. So I think that that's a universal lesson. We all need to learn it, whether we're going to Wall Street or not. If, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your questions. I do have a website called dianabhenricus.com, and many interviews that I've done elsewhere are posted there, and you may find that your question, if we didn't get to it, is answered in, uh, in some of the interviews that are posted there. I also hope that you will give a thought to The Wizard of Lies, a small plug, the paperback edition will be out on May 8th, um, and I would love to add you to my readers. I've enjoyed your, um, your presence here today. Am I to, uh, to invite you to say something? Yes. No. 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 Oh, tell them about the movie. Oh, what fun. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, this was my fourth book, but it might be my first movie. How cool. HB, <laughs> wait, they don't call it Tinseltown for nothing, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, HBO did option the movie, uh, the book, for a possible movie for HBO, and they are ser in serious negotiations with Robert De Niro to play the role of Bernie Madoff, which I think would be really neat. I had one, can I name drop here, I had one conference call with De Niro as these negotiations were unfolding. Well, I know, whoever knew. I was, I was such a horrible fan. I said, oh, Mr. De Niro, I couldn't call, I couldn't bring myself to call him Bob. But he gets on the phone on this conference call and he says, Diana, <coughs> yes, Mr. De Niro, Diana, I am Bernie Madoff. <laughs> so, you know, I, we're hopeful a lot can go wrong before the final the final details are signed, but uh, it would be a lot of fun, and it would be a great treat at this stage in my career to, uh, to have a little, uh, a little tinsel dust, uh, a little Hollywood pixie dust uh, sprinkled on things. But I also hope that that will give you some confidence that uh, you know, this isn't spinach I'm asking you to read here. It's actually pretty exciting, and, it, uh, uh, and you might actually enjoy it. Uh, thank you again for your attention. I've loved being here.